Thanks to the organizers for having me here. <clears throat> It'll be a pleasure to try to <clears throat> convey some of the research I did over the past 20 years. <clears throat> um, the uh, first lecture is basically my experience um, starting 97 when I joined the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research as a department head on data and computation. And I was supposed, I, I at the same time received this mathematics professorship at Freie Universität Berlin that I still have. And at the time, the challenge was to build a bridge between my colleagues in mathematics on the one hand and the climate modelers at the Potsdam Institute on the other. And um, since I wasn't in either field, I was an engineer. I opened the textbooks of theoretical meteorology and climate research, and then the first thing I stumbled over was in each of the chapters or each of the papers on theoretical things of atmosphere dynamics, you find a different set of model equations, and typically they are derived somewhere, and you go back in the literature, and then what you find is that there's some basic assumptions being made that this is the fundamental equations we want to work with, Boussinesque or some boundary layer or shallow water, and then come some physical arguments why this is the relevant scale of the phenomenon of interest, and then you go into your equations, assume the different scales, throw away a couple of terms, sometimes more sophisticated derivations are done, and then you end up with a reduced model that now is supposed to explain the phenomenon, and off you go. And that, from the perspective of the modeler, is of course what you should do, because that you, describes the phenomenon you are interested in and you follow closely, closely your physical intuition, but it's not something I could tell my mathematics friends because they wouldn't be able or not willing to follow just a physical argument to throw away a term. They would want to see a, more a procedure that starts from something that we all believe is the right set of equations for this huge set of phenomena and then find a systematic path of model reduction towards one or the other of the reduced models. And how I basically build such a story is first part of my course and this lecture. So I'll start with a motivation. I'll discuss scale analysis and distinguish limits. I will then get to the model hierarchy of atmospheric flows and I have a puzzle for you as homework for tomorrow. Um, so let's start. The motivation is uh, basically coded in three pictures <clears throat> which show um, processes in the atmosphere happening on kilometers and tens of minutes of time scales, cloud formation, deep convection, things like that, precipitation. Um, then when you look at weather maps we see on TV in the evening or on the internet uh, at uh, Weather Online, you see typically high and pre low pressure systems indicated by constant pressure curves um, that travel across Europe in a matter of days and the diameter of these beasts is about a thousand kilometers. And when you go to climate research, um, this is a picture I got from Stefan Ramsdorf at Potsdam Institute. It shows the <coughs> Temperature change averaged over a season between today um, and 8,000 years ago. They had this reduced complexity climate model that was just basically 15 by 15 grid boxes. It was very nicely derived by, by Vladimir Petukov and his team from uh, Moscow who joined the Potsdam Institute at the time. And um, by the way, this simulation showed the transition of the Sahara region from a completely wood-covered, um, forest-covered uh, area to a desert that it is now. And they were able to reproduce that with this model. But anyway, for the present purposes, uh, of course, these are scales of, of planetary dimension and uh, time scales of at least a season, but you want to simulate over hundreds and thousands of years. Now, when you open the textbooks and you look, 
at the description of this behind each of the pictures, spiritually you find a different set of equations. I don't expect you in the back to be able to read uh, these, but it doesn't matter, listen to what I'm saying. Um, basically, on the smallest scales, the cloud formation 10 kilometer, 20 minute time scale, we have a full set of fluid dynamics, three directions of momentum balance, we have a mass conservation law, we have transport of entropy, um, everything we know from fluid dynamics, so the world is sort of in order and you add like the gravity and the Coriolis force to basically spice it up with a little geophysics. Then if you go to the weather scales, a couple of days and thousands of kilometers, the world looks very differently. Because what you have as the reference model for this scale that was derived in the 50, 40s and 50s of last uh, uh, century is the quasi-geostrophic equations, <clears throat> which have one scalar quantity Q that is called the potential vorticity, and it's a measure of the vertical component of rotation of the fluid. It's a scalar quantity, and that scalar quantity is advected around only in the horizontal direction by this U0, so it's just pushed by the fluid. And at every instance in time, if you have the complete scalar field, Q, available, then you can invert a couple of elliptic equations to reconstruct a um, um, stream function like pressure field, pi, and that gives you the vorticity, and then from the vorticity you can reconstruct the velocity field, u0, which again pushes your q. So in a sense it's a closed set of equations, but obviously there's no distinguishable momentum balance anymore. It's just a scalar quantity that's pushed around. So how the hell was I supposed to describe where this is coming from to my mathematics friends who think that three-dimensional fluid dynamics is what governs the gas in the atmosphere. And then in climate, it becomes even worse. How did I go about it? How did I basically ask, or I asked the question, how do all these reduced models relate to what we would consider the truth, more or less, namely the um, compressible flow equations with a couple of generalized source terms for turbulence and things I don't want to discuss in this lecture. But basically, we have horizontal um, momentum balances, we have a vertical momentum balance, we have a, a um, mass conservation law, we have the transport of entropy or a quantity that's called potential temperature. Who knows what, is, what potential temperature is? Ah, not so many, just one sort of. Uh, so potential temperature is the following. It's very intuitive. Suppose you take a parcel of air at height Mount Everest, and then you isolate it from its surroundings thermally, so no heat can go in and out by heat conduction. But the balloon is weak, so it doesn't resist any pressure. Now you take that balloon and you bring it down to the sea level, so that the air gets compressed, but the there's no thermal energy exchange. That's what's called an adiabatic process. And then the temperature you measure at sea level pressure is the potential temperature of that parcel of air. So potential temperature means take a parcel of air from anywhere and bring it adiabatically down to one bar atmosphere, one reference pressure, and that's the potential temperature. Why is it so important? It's important because of what I call the uh, latte macchiato waves. If you get a good latte macchiato, then you have uh, coffee uh, on the bottom and milk on top, and the, sh the foam is flat and it doesn't move, but the interface between the milk and the coffee slowly moves around. And that's due to the fact that milk and coffee have slightly different densities, and so you have a wave process. It's, however, completely internal inside the fluid, because the the top is flat and doesn't move, okay? And this is important, now get, let me get to, to potential temperature. If you take two parcels of air from different locations that have different potential temperatures, and you bring them at the same level part, next to each other for, with a given pressure, then obviously the one with the higher potential temperature will be hotter than the other partner, 
if it's hotter at the same pressure, it's lighter, it has lower density, and therefore it will have a positive buoyancy relative to the other parcel. So therefore, the potential temperature is responsible for restoring forces in the atmosphere that make waves. That's the, the, the dynamic importance of, of potential temperature. By the way, from that formula, you can derive that for an ideal gas with constant heat capacities, the potential temperature is just a function of entropy, one uh, monotonic function of entropy. So for simplification, if you are more familiar with entropy as a notion, then you can think of potential temperature essentially being entropy. Okay, so back to the story. This is the full set of equations that one would think uh, are the truth for the atmosphere and how do we get systematically to the reduced equations without making a priori assumptions about the length scale of a phenomenon or something, but get to something that's universal for the entire atmosphere on Earth. That was the goal. And here we go. Scale analysis and distinguished limits. So in my studies, I learned that the first thing you do when you have a system of fluid dynamics, you try to find quantities of influence that characterize the system and that hopefully are independent of any specific phenomenon you're interested in. And here, for Earth and atmosphere, we have a couple of them that are rather obvious, namely Earth radius, the rota rotation rate of Earth, the acceleration of gravity, the sea level pressure, which is basically due to the fact that um, the pressure near the ground has to balance the weight of the column of air by hydrostatic balance, so that basically sets uh, the pressure near the ground at one bar. Um, then the freezing temperature of water uh, is a good reference, but that it's, it could be incidental. Why is that a good reference? We have to think of how is the balance of temperature of internal energy in the atmosphere settled when we receive radiation from the sun and Earth radiates it back into space. It's an open system after all. And it turns out that if you do the thought experiment of removing all the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, then you just look at the radiative balance, uh, radiation from the sun, and then uh, radiate back at a reference temperature into space, you end up with 250 Kelvin, taking into account only the greenhouse effect that comes from clean air without any other uh, substances. 250 Kelvin is close enough uh, to this here, and in fact, the difference is made up by uh, mostly water, which is the strongest greenhouse gas we know of, and other greenhouse gases. So uh, that's a reasonable reference. And then there's another, there's an energetic quantity that definitely is of importance for the atmosphere. That's the latent heat content of water vapor at saturation at the reference conditions, say, near the equator. That's where the most of the um, water from the ocean is picked up by the atmosphere. And the latent heat content is that, in this case. That's another reference that we always have available. And then, of course, there's properties of the gas and uh, the isentropic exponent that's already the dimensionless quantity. Now, scale analysis or similarity theory tells us if you have um, seven quantities of influence of this type. And at the same time, you have four physical fundamental dimensions like mass, length, time, and temperature. Then um, it's seven minus three dimensionless, ver independent dimensionless variables that you can form from these that characterize your system. And if you wanted to, for example, build a laboratory Earth, you could scale it down, and if you made sure that the three parameters, the three dimensionless parameters that uh, you've, you picked coming from your rescaled lab Earth are the same as for the real Earth, you would have a hope that at least all the processes that are correct, characterized by these um, numbers would actually be reproduced, used in the laboratory one-to-one. -one. You could actually rescale and go, go back to Earth. That's the entire magic of making experiments in the laboratory. 
So you can combine these, and I combined them into dimensionless quantities as an example here. Of course, any multiplication of the three is again uh, a dimensionless quantity. Therefore, I'm emphasizing it's three independent dimensionless variables. You cannot reduce below three. Otherwise, you are missing some of the quantities of influence. Good, so now I combined them in such a way that they have an intuitive meaning. The first one is basically the pressure scale height, which is basically the height you have to go into the in the vertical so that the pressure drops by a factor of E, Euler number. That's about eight kilometers, the height of Mount Everest. So if you go up there, be sure the air is very thin up there. So it's a, an appreciable pressure change. Um, divided by radius of Earth, and that's rather a small number. And that means simply that the atmosphere is a very thin shell around the Earth, the, the sphere of the Earth. The second quantity is a non-dimensionalized la latent heat release from saturated water parcel, air parcel. And that comes out to be about a, a tenth, also a relatively small number. And then the third one is sort of funny. Um, it's a reference sound speed, or um, actually it's the shallow water wave speed of the atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere also has shallow water waves that are called lamp waves. Uh, and they travel essentially at the isothermal sound speed, which is the square root of GH scale, um, just like in the shallow water formula. And it's about 300 meters per second. And omega times A is the speed of points on the equator due to the rotation of Earth. So when we are at the equator, this number here comes out to be 0.5, we are zooming around at Mach 2, supersonically which is sort of funny, but you, and we don't feel it because the, Earth, uh, the, uh, the, the atmosphere is, of course, rotating with Earth, so we are not having to sustain a wind of Mach 2 that blows against us. Anyway, so these are the three numbers, and the, two, the first two of them are rather small. The third one, you can argue, 0.5. In fact, at the beginning, when I had first written this down, I thought, this is order one. But the others are small, and I can reasonably hope to do some asymptotic analysis, limit analysis on the governing equations to extract uh, structural information from the consequences of these numbers to be small. Now comes um, an important aspect. Namely, I was um, uh, trained in multiple scales asymptotics back and forth in my studies doing combustion, and I knew that what is called distinguished limits is an, a very important uh, thing to think of early on in, in, a, in, a, in a study that tries to do asymptotics for a complex system like fluid dynamics. Distinguished limits, in my terminology, means I'm taking my three parameters that may be small or are reasonably small, and I'm tying them to one parameter epsilon that I then let go to zero. Now that seems to be a drastic step to do because the origin of the numbers here is completely independent. I could choose them independently of each other and I could independently ch change these parameters if I were to go from one planet in the universe to another one. So tying them together, what I'm doing is I'm following a family of Earths, so to speak, that live on a curve in parameter space. Why is that so important? Let me explain it to you on the basis of a very simple example, namely the linear oscillator. Even for the linear oscillator, I can show you that the picking a distinguished limit is, is absolutely crucial. So suppose we have a linear oscillator that has a certain mass, a spring force and a damping force, and there is a demon, for example, that forces it from outside. Then the governing equation obviously is Newton's law with uh, mass times acceleration. If I put these guys on the other side, it's the sum of all forces. I have initial data. And now I, have, I can form two small uh, parameters if I'm thinking of the limit of small mass and small damping for the linear oscillator. That, suppose that was my, my challenge. 
Then the two parameters, one comes from the mass, is m omega squared, where omega is the external frequency of the, of the demon. Um, m omega squared over c is one parameter, and delta is the damping-related parameter. It's k omega over c. And both are supposed to be small compared to unity, and I'm interested in what's the behavior of the linear oscillator when epsilon and delta are both small. The bad news is that um, after non-dimensionalizing, I can write the equation to make epsilon and delta explicit. Now I can try to solve this asymptotically, but the question is, is there a unique limit for epsilon delta going to zero? And there isn't. And the reason is, if you take general initial data that are not uh, such that basically the spring equals the force, in which case dropping this is actually a solution, y equals cosine of t. But obviously our differential equation allows for two initial data, two independent initial data, and so I can basically displace y at time zero from the balanced solution, and then obviously this isn't a solution anymore, and I have to expect something else to happen. What happens is this. Suppose we let epsilon, the mass, be small, very small, and delta to be reasonably small. Okay? So in, a, in some sense, we take the sequential limit, first the mass goes to zero, and then the damping. What happens in that case is you get an overdamped system. The amplitude falls to zero immediately. The, the cosine F0 is zero in this case. So the amplitude goes to zero and stays there and never comes back. If, on the other hand, you make the mass reasonably small and let the damping go to zero more quickly, then, of course, there's an oscillation left. There's inertial forces. You get a rapid oscillation that's weakly modulated by, this, by the weak damping. So, obviously, depending on how you move into the origin um, in parameter space, epsilon and delta, either this way, first mass to zero, then damping, or first damping to zero, or um, then, and then mass, or along any of the curves, you have to expect a different answer. And that's quite generally true in multi-parameter, singularly perturbed systems, where when you drop the, uh, or set the parameter to zero, you actually lose one or two derivatives in, your, in a differential equation. And in that case, that's the typical situation. Now, in the atmosphere, in our equation system of the atmosphere, uh, um, we have, uh, in fact, a couple of singular perturbations that come with, as we know, the Mach number and the Froude number and, and so on and so forth. And so, therefore, picking a distinguished limit is something you have to do first before you can actually even start doing the analysis. You won't get anything with a general expansion trying to keep the parameters independent of each other. Just for the mathematicians in the room, um, what we are trying to do is, naively speaking, tailor expansions around the origin and parameter space of the solution as a function of epsilon and delta. We know that tailor expansions exist, at least to the first term, that's non-trivial, only if the full gradient exists, the Frechet derivative exists. Now, in this case, it doesn't, as I showed you before. The way out of the problem is to say, ah, we know that Gateau derivatives, meaning directional derivatives, derivatives along any direction, fixed direction in the parameter space, are, exist under much more general conditions than the full Frechet derivative. And so therefore, I can validly ask, can't I do asymptotics just along a fixed direction in parameter space? Ah, that's our first distinguished limit in which case epsilon would be proportional to delta with a di different factor of proportionality. Now, distinguished limits are a generalization of that because you allow yourself not to only go along straight lines, but to go along predefined curves into the origin and then basically do expansions in the remaining parameter along that curve. That's a different way, more mathematically, uh, of looking at distinguished limits. Okay, so here we are. I picked this distinguished limit, and now I can move on. I 
um, can non-dimensionalize my equations and I can start trying to derive something meaningful. And the non-dimensionalization, I consciously picked to start with the smallest scales. So I non-dimensionalize horizontal and vertical coordinates by the scale height of 8.8 .8 kilometers. The um, time I non-dimensionalize by the advection time scale across this length. So the time a typical flow field would need to pass along the 8 to 10 kilometers, which is the 20 minute time scale for the cloud formation processes. Um, and then, um, so that gives me my velocity. Uh, I take the reference velocity also to non-dimensionalize the flow speeds and then the pressure density and temperature basically have natural um, non-dimensionalizations by the reference quantities I already, already picked, the quantities of influence. By the way, there is one thing that at this stage already came out and was, came to as a surprise to most of the meteorologists I talked to. Namely, in the textbooks, you typically read and 10 meters per second is the reference velocity for our phenomenon. And they never tell you where the 10 meters per second is coming from. And I was puzzled because I never found it anywhere. Now, it turns out you can combine the quantities of influence that I showed you, where the delta theta here is the potential temperature change due to latent heat release, so it relates to my quantities of influence. This gives me a flow velocity, this funny combination, and it turns out to be what is called the thermal wind relation, which is the, the if, you, if you look at a, an atmosphere in hydrostatic balance, we heard about that a lot, and in geostrophic balance, where the Coriolis force balances the horizontal pressure gradient. It turns out that if in that situation you have a temperature gradient in the horizontal, like we have it from the pole to the equator, that induces a vertical shear wind. And that vertical shear, as imposed by the temperature difference from pole to equator, turns out to be 12 meters per second. And that gives us a very natural reference, and we didn't have to invent it uh, from anywhere. Nice side effect, not very, maybe not very important, but to me it was very satisfying that I never had to assume a velocity, it just came out of, of the general parameters of influence. Okay, the next step is then to insert everything into the governing equations. I end up with, again, compressible flow equations that now have one parameter epsilon floating around that represents actually uh, the well-known parameters, I show that on the next slide, of the, uh, meteorology. Um, but now this is the equation set I can start doing asymptotics with in letting epsilon go to zero. Now here is the promised relationship. The Mach number, for example, in this case is epsilon to the power three over two, it so happens. Then there's a Rossby number for the weather pattern scale, which is epsilon itself. And then there is a fruit number for internal waves, for the latte macchiato waves, that happens to be epsilon as well, and so on and so forth. So now I can start talking to the meteorologists where I can relate what they are usually use, using as their dimensionless parameters to the setup that I have been uh, developing. And at the same time, I can relate the pressure scale height to all sorts of length scales that the meteorologists talk about all the time, like the mesoscale, the synoptic scale, the Obukov scale, and so on and so forth. They are related to the pressure scale height by straight powers of epsilon. Notice the meteorologists would argue that there exists a synoptic scale because they observe the weather pattern. Here, it comes out as being a natural length scale in the problem that's related to the parameters of influence that I picked to begin with. Not, it's not a priori related to physical phenomenon that has to come out later. The, the length scale is in the system. It's predi predicated already by the quantities of influence. So in that sense, it's a, a, an interesting twist on the, the entire approach. And here is a little calculation that shows you how the synoptic scale through all these quantities actually relates to the scale height. I don't want to go to the details here. So I have it that far, and now the rest of it basically is do asymptotics. 
meaning you let the solution vector of density, pressure, velocities, etc., depend on space and time and epsilon by expanding in an asymptotic sequence where phi i could be just straight powers of epsilon, it could be odd powers of epsilon, rational powers of epsilon, some sequence of functions that systematically get smaller as the index i becomes bigger. Then we allow for expansion functions that depend, of course, on t, x, and z, and the epsilon dependence is the whole point to which I'm getting on the next transparency. Uh, and then hopefully I finish up somewhere with low order terms. Another remark to the mathematicians in the room, oftentimes I get asked, well, does your asymptotic series actually converge? And if it doesn't converge, if I, can, if I have to admit, most likely it doesn't converge, then ah, this cannot be any good. But that's not the right answer or not the right way of looking at it. If I have a function that has one derivative at least everywhere, right, then I know I have a best linear approximation to that function locally. And I know that the deviation from the best linear approximation is higher order. It goes to zero faster than linear in, in the distance from the reference point. So I can actually use a, just a Taylor expansion to the leading and first term as a good approximation of the function. And it doesn't have to converge. The Taylor series doesn't have to converge in order to give me a meaningful approximation of two terms or three terms. So this is why typically asymptotics geeks never drive things farther than order three or so, and that's already ambitious because typically things are too complicated. You never want to go there. You are happy if you get the leading order solution, you understand the nonlinearities and whatever interesting complicated things are happening there, and maybe get the next order correction to make sure you, you move closer to the solution um, if you wanted to, but that's where you typically stop. And the question of whether the, the sequence converges or not is, is not of prime interest in the application context. It's a mathematically very interesting question, but to me a more interesting mathematical question is if I derive a reduced uh, order, a reduced equation set that's valid up to leading and first order, then to prove that everything I haven't take, taken into account is actually smaller than epsilon squared or smaller than the last term I kept. That's more interesting of a question rather than the convergence of a sequence. Anyway, okay, so that was a, another side remark and now we have this and now how did I pick <clears throat> the epsilon dependence of these guys to, ma to make the connection to the scale-dependent models of meteorology that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and here it is. So the, the, the leftover step is simply to say, I'm looking systematically at different length and time scales. So let me pick an example. Say um, x is now a dimensionless coordinate that measures horizontal distances, and it was non-dimensionalized by 8.5 kilometers, by the scale height of pressure. Okay, so when x changes by one, I'm passing a distance of 8.5 kilometers. When the new coordinate epsilon square x changes by one, what kind of distance have I passed? Hmm? I, I repeat the question, yes. So um, it, it was clear x measures in units of scale height. Now, in which units measures the coordinate epsilon squared x? What's the, ch yeah. It's an extraordinary dimension. What is that? It would be the same dimension as x because epsilon has no dimension. No, no, um, I, mean, I mean something else. Let me write it down. Um, So x is equal to some dimensional x divided by the scale height, right? So now I want, I want to know from you epsilon squared x, but I'm, once I write it down, it basically is the answer already. What is it? It's 
uh, epsilon squared times x prime over h scale. And I can write this as x prime over h scale over epsilon squared. So I have a new coordinate, let me call it xi, which measures the dimensional distances in units of a much bigger length, the length h scale divided by epsilon squared. And if you go back to the last slide, um, that was what the meteorologists would call the synoptic scale. So, and as expected, the synoptic scale is the weather pattern, high pressure, low pressure diameter, characteristic diameter. So as expected, if you use the epsilon squared x and you go to the slowed down time scale too, you end up with exactly the quasi-geostrophic model that was in the middle of my tr third transparency that was just the advection of the potential vorticity. Um, incidentally, if you do the same rescaling, but you go from the middle latitudes to the equator, you get a different model. That's because at the equator, the Coriolis force is zero, and so you have only perturbations around zero Coriolis force, and then the dominant balances are different, and then you get a model that is called the weak temperature gradient model. And by rescaling space and time in different ways, I could rederive a whole family of models that you find typically in the different chapters of Pedlowski's Bible of Theoretical Meteorology or Adrian Gill's book and so on and so forth, which was sort of nice. And I could draw a picture, a graph uh, in an annual reviews report that I wrote in 2010, um, where on the horizontal axis I have length scales in terms of the scale height times powers, inverse powers of epsilon, and here the advection time rescaled with powers of epsilon, and then by standard asymptotic arguments, you could straightforwardly derive the Boussinesq equations on small scales, the quasi-geostrophic equation, which I already mentioned, weak temperature gradient approximations of different types, the hydrostatic primitive equations, which are the at the core of most climate models today, um, planetary geostrophic, etc., etc. So all of them come out, and there is one more twist in this diagram. Remember, look at that odd thing here, the Obukov scale. Originally, remember, I had this third parameter, which was C ref over omega a. I set it to order one instead of square root of epsilon. If I set it to order one, it turns out that the Obukov scale becomes planetary. It's identical. So the, the Obukov scale is a, a, the length scale which the shallow water waves of the atmosphere have to travel before they see an order one influence of the Coriolis force. Similarly, the synoptic scale is the distance a, a, a Latta Macchiato wave has to travel before it feels the influence of Coriolis forces. Since the shallow water waves are faster, their scale is bigger. Now, I read, reread uh, many times Pedlowski's derivation of the quasi-geostrophic theory in his textbook, and there's one line there that says, and by the way, the external Rossby radius, which is synonymous to this one, is by square root of epsilon bigger than the synoptic scale, and he doesn't explain it, he just says so. And then I went back and observed, oh, with my, in, in my setting it didn't come out, the Obukov scale was planetary, so I had to go back, and I went back to my distinguished limit, and then I set the C ref over omega a to square root of epsilon, and voila, everything remained the same, except this Obukov scale went to here, and now I have really Petlowski's book covered. Now, up to that point, meteorologists, when I talked to them about it, they would always say, okay, we knew all these equations, so what's new? And in some sense, there's not much new yet, except for one or two little twists. I never had to assume, pre-assume any physical phenomenon, right? I was blind to that. I just used the universal quantities of influence to, to build the entire argument. Secondly, I received all of these models out of one and the same distinguished limit. 
That wasn't clear to me to begin with. It could have been the way these equations are derived in the textbooks that one person was implicitly making other assumptions about the limit process than the next one in the other paper. But it so happens that all the models are consistent with each other under one and the same distinguished limit. And that's ex excellent news for me because now I can start playing the games I like, namely start to study interactions between different scales. Because now that I know the, for example, the quasi-geostrophic equation is on the same limit path, except for space-time rescalings, as, say, the hydrostatic primitive equations, I can start studying their interactions by using methods of multiple scales that I will discuss in the other two lectures. If I hadn't had that fact that they all live on the same curve in parameter space, I couldn't do multiple scales theory. I would have to reinvent something new and possibly would have to come up with models on different scales that weren't in the literature yet, but it so happens they are all consistent. So that's nice, and so this is why um, I can now um, start doing multiple scales analysis very nicely, and that I will discuss in the next lecture. Before I explain the puzzle to you, are there responses, feedbacks, questions, complaints about my lecture so far? Mm -hmm. Do we have a, yeah. <laughs> Good, uh, uh, compatible. Uh, uh, Why No. <laughs> I. Based on some uh, observations. Or? Well, the ob obviously the meteorologists looked at the phenomenon and combined it with mathematical derivations, and the phenomena guided them to doing what they did. And of obviously, they are also. They're intelligent people, they know what they're doing, they have all this experience, so they ended up with a set of equations that happens to be compatible. Mm -hmm. But there, is, there was no explanation of why that happened. Uh, there was no guiding principle that led them to this, except make sure you are compatible with the phenomena that are being observed. Can you read it? Okay. So, uh, were meteorologists extremely lucky who had to that kind of relationship also exist in oceanography, for example? Uh, whether or, this or kind of relation exists for oceanography? For be, between type of models in oceanography. Oh. Um, it does exist. I haven't much looked at it. I know that, for example, the synoptic scale, the analog of this in the ocean, is not 1,000 kilometers, but 50 kilometers, so it's really very different. But it so happens that, for example, the, the flatness parameter, like 5 kilometers ocean depth divided by radius of Earth, that's the same for the atmosphere and the ocean. So in principle, you could uh, approach atmospheric science by the same token and the same ideas and end up with a hierarchy of models there too. And I believe we have a lecture on that tomorrow, starting tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Do the circles overlap? Because epsilon is not that, that small uh, yeah. in what you show. So is there some? Is there some overlap? Yes. Um, Hmm. What do you mean by overlap? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so let me, so let me, um, you, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I will get to it tomorrow when I discuss the, the blue colored region here where actually things do overlap and cannot so simply be separated from, it, from each other. Um, basically what you, 
always have when you do asymptotics of this type, then the, as I explained earlier, one of the reduced models always basically has a certain set of phenomena filtered out. The quasi-geostrophic equations don't have internal gravity waves. They're just gone. And so therefore, yes, there is somehow an overlap with, for example, the hydrostatic primitive equations. If you take the hydrostatic primitive equations and go to the long time large scale limit, you can recover again the quasi-geostrophic equations. So they are, they, they are somehow, these, these equations are part of these in a certain limit that you can recover. But the, the one that's more reduced with a larger scale separation here um, in time than the one that is, has a higher time resolution, you can never go back from here to there. The phenomena on fast time scales are killed in this setting and you have a hope to have them, the slow phenomena still in there so you could actually go further up in time. And so on and so forth. You could argue the same in space. Is there any other question before homework? Ah, yeah. I'd like to go back to the um, series expansion of uh, mm -hmm. you in, in terms of epsilon. Okay, what you discussed that UI depends on epsilon, it still bothers me a little bit to have a formal expansion with epsilon, with epsilon inside UI. Yeah. You say that U still depends on the scales, but do the scales not uh, get expanded as well or not? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so you should read it like this. I, I'm, uh, let me go to the... Uh, example of the quasi-geostrophic theory again. So for example, u of x, z, t, and epsilon, I want to expand it as a u0 of um, epsilon squared x, z, epsilon squared t, plus um, epsilon u1, and so on and so forth. Now what I'm doing is I say, this is a xi, and this is a tau, and then that's the same as u0 of xi, z, eps, um, and tau, plus epsilon u1 of the same arguments. Now, xi, z, and tau are assumed to be independent of epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, which means I'm systematically looking at the larger scales relative to the scale height that I started with. Right, so as epsilon goes to zero, in my original units of measure, I look at larger and larger scales. That's a very good point, and it's, it's especially important when you start looking at scale interactions, because then you can't cheat your way around this anymore. You, you then have expansions that rather look like uh, this. You have multiple scales. And then the UI looks something like epsilon squared x, um, x and z, and, and for example, epsilon squared t and t. And then suddenly you have extended your coordinate space from a problem in four dimensions to one in 10 dimensions. And then a whole hell breaks loose and you have to use different techniques. Okay, let me explain the, the puzzle. Um, so this was my non-dimensionalized set of equations and we want to walk through a very simple exercise of just letting epsilon go to zero, see what happens. Okay, and I'm keeping only the leading terms in, in each of the equations. Obviously, the mass equation has no epsilon in it, I keep it. The transport of entropy or potential temperature has no epsilon, I keep it. And the dominant terms in the momentum equations is just the uh, 1 over epsilon cube terms. Let, let's see what the consequences would be. So I go here, I say um, from this equation, the horizontal, obviously the horizontal pressure gradient has to be zero. Oops, 
stay with me, yes, has to be zero, right? I, so this I take for granted. Then that's given. At the next is from um, the equation of um, number two, which was the hydrostatic balance. That's this and this storm survives. These two survive and nobody else, right? That's my hydrostatic balance. I apply the horizontal gradient to this equation and immediately I get that the horizontal gradient of rho is equal to zero. I apply the horizontal gradient to the theta equation and to the equation five and then I also get that the horizontal gradient of theta is zero. So the horizontal gradients of all the thermodynamic quantities have to vanish. Good, I go next into equation four, which is the DDT of, um, of, um, of theta, that is, um, yes, the, it's d theta dt plus u v horizontal dot gradient horizontal of theta, which is zero, plus w d theta dz is equal to zero. Aha, I apply the horizontal gradient, and this guy goes away, this guy goes away. Um, uh, no, um, um, no, it's not true. What, what remains is um, w times um, the horizontal gradient of w times d theta dz is equal to zero. Since I want a stably stratified atmosphere that can carry waves, that, um, that guy is, stays. Ah, I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? Um, this guy stays, and I have that the horizontal gradient of w is also zero. Um, if that is the case, I can go to the mass equation, and I conclude, taking the horizontal gradient, that the divergence of the velocity is um, just a function of z. Um, and then I integrate this guy. Um, the, um, yes, that, that the horizontal gradient is just a function of the vertical. It has no horizontal gradient. And then I integrate from the bottom to top. And let me assume for the moment I have a, a flat bottom and a flat top that are rigid. Then I integrate this and I get d of z is equal to zero. And once I have this, I can derive from the um, um, three, four, and five, a, se a second order equation for the vertical velocity. And since I have a bottom and top boundary condition of velocity is equal to zero, I get w equal to zero and nothing can move. That's disappointing. I started with a, an equation set that's valid supposedly for the 10 kilometer, 20 minute length and time scales. And I apply my straightforward asymptotic analysis or limit. And I get, I, can have, I cannot have a vertical velocity. I can only have horizontal shear flows. That's obviously not what we would like to have. And the question is, where did I make in my brief hand-waving assumptions, where did I make a um, step that I could basically reverse, where I made too strong an assumption, where I could get around that constraint of w equal to zero and get the vertical velocity again and get the, the, the fluid to move <clears throat> non-trivially. So again, um, Let's walk through it. No, I have one more minute. Let's walk through it again slowly. So the leading term, the leading term here was horizontal pressure gradient zero, <clears throat> hydrostatic balance from these two terms. I can apply the horizontal gradient to this equation, and I conclude that the density is also horizontally homogeneous. That finishes with that. Then I go to the um, equation of state, which was this one. And if these guys don't have a horizontal gradient, then obviously theta doesn't have a horizontal gradient either. And that kills all the variation in the horizontal of the thermodynamic quantities. Then I went back to the theta equation, which I did here. And I concluded 
by applying horizontal gradient, um, this storm goes away. This is anyway not there because theta has no horizontal gradient. And then from WDDZ of theta equals zero, I can get no horizontal gradient of W. And then from the mass equation, again, applying the horizontal gradient, uh, and this is the full three-dimensional divergence, I can conclude that the horizontal gradient of div horizontal of V horizontal plus DW dz is equal to zero. Now the horizontal gradient of W is zero, so this goes away. So this means what I had here. The horizontal gradient of the divergence is zero, which means it can only depend on the vertical. And with my top and bottom boundary condition, no, with the, ah, this was wrong. Um, here I integrate horizontally over the domain, and I, I'm, I'm assuming rigid walls. And if I do that, there's no odd flux around the border, and then I get that um, the d of z is equal to zero. By the way, this also works if I assume the far field to have no velocity and I make it infinite, an infinite domain. So it doesn't have to be rigid walls in the horizontal. So this means d of z is equal to zero. And then when I go back um, three, four, and five, I reinsert basically these quantities into each other and I end up with one equation for w and then I can kill it with um, the boundary conditions. So where did I make too strong an assumption so that I was forced to let w equal to zero? That is my question for tomorrow. I'll get back to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.